Okay, so I think we might as well start. Uh, and uh, as usual, we'll do a little bit of meditation together. Uh, we'll have a talk and some Q&A at the end, uh, and then we'll see what happens. Does that sound reasonable? Uh, yeah, and if nothing happens, that's okay as well. Actually, nothing happening is the best thing here. Yeah. So we'll see if nothing happens. Okay, so let's get into it. <laughs> okay, so to start off, as usual, by just closing your eyes. And uh, one of the great things about closing your eyes is that you shut out so much of the noise of the world. Uh, you feel peaceful. Just by closing your eyes, you feel peaceful. A little bit peaceful, straight away. Huh? And then feel the body. Huh? Make sure you are at ease, you have no pains, you have no problems anywhere. Huh? It's only going to be a short meditation, but still it's important to be comfortable. Huh? So just start off with those very simple instructions. Huh? Just to be at ease, to be comfortable, huh? to allow the body to kind of fade away. Huh? And then always make sure that you really relax and uh, you can't, can't really relax too much. Uh, so really get into that idea of just letting go of everything, allowing things to fade away, uh, relaxing the body and the mind. Uh, and just take as much time as you need to really relax in a deep way. Uh. The paradox of relaxing is that you cannot really try to relax. The moment you try to relax, you're not really relaxing anymore. Huh? So what you have to do instead is to build up a perception in the mind, a, a perception that leans the mind in the right direction. Huh? The idea of just sitting in a delightful armchair huh? as if you're coming home from work in the afternoon or in the evening. Huh? And you're just sitting back and relaxing, yeah? enjoying the sense of freedom from work, yeah? allowing the mind just to flow. Yeah? That is the kind of relaxation we're talking about. Yeah? Nothing forceful, yeah? natural, easy relaxation. Yeah? And uh, all you really have to do at this stage uh, is just to sit back and allow things to flow. Uh, but also have this inclination towards peace. Uh, 
you don't really need to do very much, uh, but if the mind inclines towards peace uh, because it enjoys peace, uh, it knows what peace means, uh, that is really sufficient. Uh, and then going with the flow, allowing things to flow while inclining to peace, uh, gradually, gradually, uh, you're heading in the right direction. Uh, the mind is letting go of the world, uh, allowing the daily life just to fade into the background uh, and being replaced by peace instead. Uh. And uh, with the meditation, uh, there's this beautiful idea of just waiting for the breath. Uh, very often we go to the breath, uh, and by doing that we're already perhaps using too much willpower. Uh, but by just waiting for the breath, it means it's very easy meditation practice uh, of allowing everything to be, uh, and just waiting for all events just to unfold according to their own nature. Uh, this is an easy way of meditating. Yeah. The only thing that is required uh, is to kind of lean and encourage the mind in the right direction. Yeah.
Okay, everyone, so now just spend a few moments just uh, reflecting back on your meditation, uh, just to review what has happened uh, and to, if you have, feel a bit more peaceful and at ease than when you started out, uh, ask yourself why that is the case. Uh, Okay, everyone, so that's it. So, uh, good, got a few more people here since we <laughs> started the meditation. That's kind of like magic, so more people appear, that's very nice. So, um, so uh, welcome once again. And uh, we, the topic for the uh, title of the to talk tonight is uh, Awakening 101. Uh, we might do Awakening 102 as well. Uh, we'll see, see what happens as we go along here. Uh, because uh, it is a profound subject and it's kind of difficult to do Awakening 101 here. Are you okay? No. No? Um, can you talk something about the noise? Because my dad is already working on it there. Well, yeah, they're trying, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about the idea of awakening and what that means and how to recognize people who might be awakened, yeah, who is awakened in this world, who is not. And it's kind of a, I think it's a very interesting topic, yeah. And one of the reasons why it is interesting is, first of all, because there are many people who claim to be awakened. What do we do with such claims? How do we evaluate whether there is some basis for these things or not? And there's also a lot of problems in the world. There are people who kind of claim to be awakened because it puts you in a very powerful position if people think you are awakened, right? And that can often cause serious problems. <laughs> But I had a kind of interesting thought when I was uh, just at the beginning of the meditation. I don't know, sometimes weird thoughts come into your mind during meditation. Have you, anyone else have weird thoughts during meditation? I hope I'm not the only one. That would be very embarrassing. <laughs> but, uh, so I, my thought was, I was looking at this room and I thought, wow, this room is just really decorated. Look at that ceiling. It looks like some kind of... Uh, palace, you know, when you go to those kind of old palaces where the kings live, they're overly decorated. This, and this looks a little bit like that. Uh, and if you look at this shrine here, it's a pretty impressive shrine. Huh? All kinds of Buddhas, all kinds of things happening everywhere. Huh? And the thought occurred to me, I wonder what is the correlation between awakening and the amount of artwork. I'm not going to give an answer. I'm just going to point, making this point, and then you can think about it. And maybe we can discuss it at the end if it's interesting. Is there a correlation between the amount of kind of artwork and awakening experience? Anyway, I'll, I'll leave that for, <laughs> for you to consider, uh, because uh, there are so many different ways of, of viewpoints or angles uh, from which to kind of approach this idea of awakening. And I think actually that is an interesting idea. I don't say this kind of randomly. I say it because actually there is a point there, I think. Yeah. But um, one of the um, problems that I have seen in uh, Buddhism in particular, but I think it is generally true in pro probably in all kinds of spiritual traditions, uh, and that is the tendency for people to claim awakening. Yeah. I don't know, you can go online uh, and you can find people who have websites, uh, and the name of the website is like Arahant so and so. Uh. Have you seen that? Uh? It's kind of, so if someone, that is already kind of a big red flag, right? If someone claims that they are an arahant on publicly on their website, uh, yeah, I'm fully enlightened, uh, that's already kind of a big flag. Yeah. But, uh, and this is kind of how the world is. And it is not just the case that these people claim that and that they have no followers because followers really should be put off. I'm telling you this straight up. It should really be put, put off when someone claims something like that. But they actually gain followers. This is kind of the amazing thing, right? People don't get it that when these people say something like that, actually that is already dodgy. <laughs> 
And uh, so this is kind of what we, what kind of one is up against in this world. And uh, so this is what happens within Buddhism itself. Uh, yeah. And of course, it's not just people who claim to be arahants on the internet. There are all kinds of people who claim all kinds of things. Uh, yeah. Everywhere in the world. Uh, and so it is very important to have some guidelines on how to deal with these things. Uh, and it's not just about Buddhism. Uh, Words like awakening and enlightenment, they are used across all kinds of spiritual traditions. Uh, you find it in Hinduism. Is Hindu awakening, is that the same as Buddhist awakening? Or is it different? Uh, what about New Age people? They will sometimes claim awakening. Is, that, is New Age awakening the same as Old Age awakening? No, wait, wait a minute. No, <laughs> Buddhism is like an old tradition. So, uh, but you know what I mean, right? Uh, so, and, and then we have other people who cause a claim awakening and who have no kind of particular spiritual tradition. How do we evaluate all of this? How do, what does it kind of, how does it all fit together? Yeah. And I think as a starting point, uh, we can assume that words like awakening and enlightenment uh, because they're not very precisely defined, uh, we can assume that people will make, use these words in whatever way they feel is appropriate in their life, right? We can assume that uh, because they're, they're not precisely defined. So someone will say, okay, I had some kind of experience. I feel a bit awakened, so I'll call myself awakened, right? Uh, that's often how things are. Uh, this is kind of how th things often work. So we, I think we can assume as a bare minimum that it's going to be problematic when people make these claims. Uh, precisely because these are words that are used in a very loose fashion. They don't have any precise definition. Unless, unless you are a Buddhist, and unless you understand that Buddhism, what really matters in Buddhism, is the teachings of the Buddha. This is the standard by which everyone should measure anything in the world, yeah? including awakening itself. So this is kind of the benefit of coming from an ancient tradition like Buddhism. Not just an ancient tradition, but also a living ancient tradition. We still have people in the present day who at least claim to be awakened. And now today we're going to learn how to check it out. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we're going to say, well, is, I'm going to ask you questions. This teacher, is he awakened? And we're going to have a kind of voting. I'm going to see how many people vote for that teacher. <laughs> we're going to start with Venerable Chanda. Is Venerable Chanda awakened? We're going to see how many hands go up. <laughs> and then we kind of we have a bit of fun and games, right? Otherwise, it gets very boring. Yeah, so... so uh, uh, it will help us uh, to kind of approach this question in a sensible way. That's kind of the uh, idea behind this. Uh. And so I'm going to start off by, so this is kind of setting out the problem that we are up against. Uh, and I want to start off just by discussing a little bit the idea of awakening. Yeah? What, how, what it actually means, uh, how it is talked about uh, in the suttas, and how we can kind of come to understand this. Uh. And one of the um, important things about awakening uh, is that it concerns understanding the nature of the world, right? It concerns truth, basically. That's really what it is about. So one of the kind of very famous and well-known words in the suttas that are used for describing the idea of awakening is uh, yata bhuta jnana dasana. Yeah, for those of you who have a Buddhist back, little bit of Buddhist background, you may know this, these words. Yata bhuta jnana dasana means knowledge and vision according to reality. Yeah? This is what we're trying to achieve. And of course, because it is knowledge and vision according to reality, this already is a very good guidance as to the sort of things that we should be looking for, where awakening can be found. Right? If, if something is according to reality, we should expect that someone who is awakened we should expect in our own mind, that is also a very good guideline for ourselves in our meditation practice, because we want to move towards awakening, and to move towards awakening, you have to become a little bit more awakened every day, right? So, uh, this idea of Yata Buddha Nanadasana means that we should start to feel more clarity here. We should start to feel that like we have more understanding of the world, of people around us, that we can deal with them in a better way. It's this feeling of emerging from confusion, from darkness, into clarity, into light, into having a better, better ability to deal with our own life and dealing with people around us, and all of these kind of things. Because this is what truth does to us. Does to us. We see things in the right way. So when you see things in the right way, you can deal with things according to truth. That makes your life easier. It's kind of obvious when you think about it. 
And this is one of the ways that I like to talk about the idea of right view. Yeah? What is right view? What is this idea of seeing things according to reality? Yeah? A very simple example is uh, you want to go down to the shop. Yeah? You're hungry. You want to get breakfast for yourself or lunch for yourself. Uh, yeah? Right view means you think the shop is on the right. Uh, yeah? And you know the shop is on the right. So you get to the shop. If you have wrong view, even though the shop is on the right, you think the shop is on the left. And so you go to the left. You never get that breakfast. Dukkha. Yeah, this is how, <laughs> you know what I mean? So dukkha arises because of wrong view. It's very simple. You don't get to have breakfast. Yeah, and if you're hungry, that's bad news. So it's as simple as that. So whenever we see things in accordance with reality, we will react, we will live in accordance with that view, and because of that we will tend to be happy, we will tend to be satisfied, because we will be able to deal with our lives in a good way. So, seeing truth, seeing things in accordance to reality, always leads to positive personal things for us. You gain clarity, you gain more happiness, you gain a reduction in suffering, you deal with life in a better way. Everything kind of comes together. Yeah? So, this is one of the obvious ways uh, that when we are dealing with awakening, uh, it should have this kind of effect. Uh, if someone is really confused and out of it, uh, if someone looks like they have crazy wisdom but not real wisdom, they're probably crazy, not wise. Uh, it's either crazy or wise, not both at the same time. Uh, yeah? Crazy wisdom is just an excuse for being able to behave the way you want because you're not enlightened. Uh. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so this is kind of the beginning, right? Uh, the idea of seeing things uh, in accordance with reality. It has, this has further implications. Uh, one of the further implications is that uh, when we awaken to the truth, uh, that truth should also align with other ways of arriving at truth. Uh, yeah? It should not be that we have to throw out scientific truths. Uh, we should not have to throw out any other kinds of truth that people have arrived at in the world, whatever, whatever medium, whatever way they have achieved those truths. So if you have to throw out certain scientific, you know, established facts, then that is problematic. Buddhism should really align with the truths as they are discovered in the world. Whatever way we arrive at truth, they should all come together. They should be complementary. If they're not, we have a serious problem. Otherwise, one is wrong and one is not is, is right, or one is wrong and one is right, or whatever I'm trying to say, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say now, but you, you get the idea. <laughs> so, uh, it's confusing sometimes to be a speaker. Uh, so, so this, uh, this is what happens. Uh, and so it, it should all kind of line up nicely. Uh, and if it doesn't, uh, then uh, we, we have a problem. Uh, and uh, that is very useful. And remember that Dalai Lama, actually Dalai Lama is a pretty... He's a pretty cool guy. He does he's done some weird things recently, but he, 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 <laughs> he, had, he had many, there's many things about him that are pretty inspiring, right? And, and I remember one of the things that he said many years ago. He said that, well, if, uh, you know, if um, our Buddhist teachings don't align with science, we have to throw them out. And I thought that's pretty cool, right? There's someone who doesn't really hold on to these teachings, but has a wise approach to, approach to these teachings, uh, and who kind of understands that there are certain things that are maybe just things that we hold on to. They're not fundamental to Buddhism anyway, so okay. So we check them out, and we kind of go for the truth. Uh, of course, there is a downside with this. Uh, we always have to be careful you don't throw out too much. Uh, we have to have some idea of the limits of science. Uh, yeah, science is always progressing, there's always new discoveries, uh, and so there are limits. Uh, so it's important to understand what are scientific truths and what are opinions of scientists. Uh, these are two different things. Uh, and so we need to kind of, kind of tread these waters a bit carefully so we don't throw out things that are very fundamental to Buddhism, like rebirth, for example. Yeah, if you throw out rebirth, you have a very serious problem. Uh, but as far as I can tell, the idea of rebirth does not really contradict any scientific truths, uh, and so we are on safe grounds there, at least so until further scientific research undermines it, which I don't think it will. I think actually it's going to be the other way around. I think uh, philosophy and science is slowly coming around to a different view of reality, which is very interesting. Yeah. So our 
Enlightenment, our awakening experience, should align with the broader realities of the world. We should not end up with some kind of crazy wisdom that has absolutely no kind of connection to the rest of reality. That is always a very dangerous sign if that is what happens. So, yeah, aligning with reality, yeah, yeah this is such an important thing. Yata, Buddha, and Anada, seeing things in accordance with reality, yeah. But the main kind of reality that we are interested in is the psychological reality, right? Buddhism, in the end, is like a psychological path. It's about purifying the mind. It's about using the mind in a positive way. So it is really psychology. People often have this discussion, what is Buddhism? Is it a religion? Maybe. Is it a philosophy? Some people argue it's a philosophy, but I argue it is a psychology. Is it religion? Well, it depends what you mean. Some Buddhists certainly treat Buddhism as a religion and they pray to the Buddha and these kind of things. Please, Buddha, I want a kind of BMW for my next life. Uh, yeah? <laughs> it's a, sometimes it is a bit like that. Yeah, Materialist Buddhism, and, and this is sometimes how it is. Uh, um, so, but is it a religion? It depends how you define religion. Uh, in some ways it might be, in other ways it's not. Uh, so it's kind of a matter of definition and so it's hard to really pin down. Is it a philosophy? I would say it's not really a philosophy. A philosophy is a kind of a thought-out system, right? And uh, welcome, 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 welcome. Please find a seat for yourself. Uh, yeah. You have missed lots of good things, you know, but anyway, you kind of get, get the last part of this, so you, you'll be fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, um, if you think I'm not, it's because Ajahn Brahm is my teacher, that's why. I have, I have an excuse. <laughs> so, uh, it is a psychology in my mind. Yeah? It's not a philosophy. Philosophy is something that is created. It's like a, a, a castle made of thought. It's a thought system. Huh? And there are parts of Buddhism that are basically philosophy. You have, for example, you have the Abhidhamma in Buddhism. Yeah? Very kind of systematization of the Dhamma that came after the time of the Buddha. That, to me, is philosophy. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 precisely because it is philosophy, it is a little bit speculative. Uh. It's about expanding on the teachings of the Buddha, filling in the gaps. That is really what the Abhidhamma is about. And then creating some kind of structure. Yeah. All these little thought moments and kind of how, they, how many billion thoughts moments there are in kind of one second. And, uh, and then it says, no one can know this except the Buddha. Well, the problem is the Buddha never taught it, so how do we know it at all? That's kind of the, the issue with these kind of things. Uh. And so it is like this um, made-up system, uh, yeah, and it's kind of artificial. Uh, and this, so I actually translate the word Abhidhamma as a philosophy in one of my translations. Uh, not sure how it's go, going to go down with the rest of the world, but uh, I'll probably be he heavily criticized for that, uh, but I'm ready to defend myself. Uh. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll see what happens uh. So, so it's not philosophy, and so, but what it, what it is, it's a kind of psychology. Yeah. It's a psychology because it is, has everything to do with the mind, how we develop the mind. Yeah. But it's a very positive kind of psychology, and it's a psychology that has a very clear purpose and a very clear end point. Yeah. And the end point is, of course, awakening. Yeah. So if Buddhism is a psychology of awakening, yeah, what does that mean? And what it means? And, one of the things, one of the ways that I like to define the idea of right view, we were just talking it today at the, when we went out for a dana today, uh, and uh, we went to, this, uh, went to a house dana, we offered some beautiful food, and uh, you know, we had a nice meal, and we are discussing uh, uh, these things, uh, and uh, talking about what Buddhism is about. And right view, yeah, often we talk about right view in terms of Re believing in rebirth, believing in kamma, believing in the awakening of the Buddha, and these kind of things. And all of these things are true. They are aspects of right view. But they're not always very practical aspects of right view. But so the foundational idea of right view is to understand the difference between happiness and suffering. And the difference between how to achieve happiness and how to achieve suffering. Or maybe how to avoid suffering is better. <laughs> That's up to you. Huh? But, so, yeah, and that is a really good definition because all of Buddhism is really about that. Huh? 
Yeah, first noble truth is a noble truth of suffering. It's about understanding suffering in the world. What is the problem? What is the issue? Is it possible to overcome this? Is it possible to find a state of great satisfaction, contentment, the highest happiness that the Buddha actually does promise us if we practice in the right way? So that is the idea of enlightenment, really. The idea of enlightenment, really, is the psychology here where we're trying to find this happiness, moving towards happiness uh, and avoiding suffering. This is the right view. Uh, and this is really what awakening is about. Uh. When I say happiness, I don't mean that in a silly way. Yeah? Sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, happiness. Yeah, who wants that? Yeah, it's kind of some, if you're really snobbish about it, you think this sounds like some kind of uh, hedonistic thing and you're kind of just looking for some si silly pleasures in life. But it's not that at all. Uh. When we talk about happiness in Buddhism, what we are really talking about is something very, very profound. Uh, we're talking about kind of the ultimate contentment. Uh, we're talking about perfect peace. One of the words that is used to describe awakening, or the Pali word is samboda, sambodhi, yeah, awakening, yeah, is upasama. Upasama means peace. Uh, yeah, this is the ultimate kind of peace is one way of thinking about Awakening, and of course, peace is a kind of happiness. Yeah? If you have peace, you feel really good. So these are some of the qualities that come when we talk about happiness. We also mean joy as well. And you mean uh, you know, all of these things. But ultimately, what really what it means, uh, it means uh, discovering the meaning of life. That is really what it comes down to. Uh, and uh, you can see this uh, yeah, when you meditate, and you do find perfect peace. Uh, because your mind is no longer driven towards anything. Yeah. There is no motivation for you to do anything anymore. If you find perfect peace, well, that's it. Yeah, you're happy. There's nowhere else to go. And because there's nothing more to do, nowhere to go, that means, by definition, yeah, you have found the answer to the meaning of life. Meaning is there because you're not, if you haven't found the meaning, there's still more to be done. There's still more to practice to go. But if you, there's nowhere to go, it means you found the meaning. Yeah. And this is the promise of Buddhism. And this is the idea of awakening, ultimately, discovering the meaning, discovering and achieving the meaning of life. And um, this is extraordinarily powerful when you think about it. Yeah, the meaning of life. I mean, the, if, if you tell people that you found the meaning of life, they think you're joking. No one has found the meaning of life. This is what philosophers have been arguing over, over mil for millennia and for centuries in all kinds of cultures around the world. Uh, anyone who thinks they found the meaning of life is utterly conceited, uh, except that uh, the Buddha found exactly that. Uh. And uh, so I have always thought that one of the biggest problems in, we have in Buddhism, I always thought, well, how come everyone isn't a Buddhist? That's what I always think. Yeah, I mean, if we have found the meaning of life, surely everyone should be a Buddhist. Uh, and I want to go down the street and ask people, excuse me, how come you're not a Buddhist? Yeah, <laughs> that would be kind of a nice exercise to do. Stop people, excuse me, are you Buddhist? No, okay, how come you're not a Buddhist? Uh, and then see what happens. And we have some kind of, you know, and then we can do some marketing research and we can figure out how to present the Dhamma better in the future. Yeah. But I think these are the sort of things that we need to learn to present the Dhamma in a way that actually we really bring out the fundamental beauty of these teachings, that it is about achieving what we all want. Yeah, the most profound sense of contentment and happiness and meaning. Yeah. Is, this is, after all, as far as I can tell, what everyone really wants in this world. Yeah. And if it is what everyone wants and we have the answer, then surely it makes sense that we should have more Buddhists. Yeah. So I think we have a marketing problem in Buddhism. Yeah. And we need to learn how to present the Dhamma in a better way. Yeah. And uh, sometimes too much talk about dukkha, 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 people turn away. We don't want dukkha, we want dukkha. We want, don't want suffering, we want happiness. Uh, and so we need to present it in that way. Uh. And um, so I think that there is enormous potential for these Buddhist teachings uh, if they are presented rightly. Uh. Are they going to be presented rightly? Uh, probably not. Uh. <laughs> what can you do? Uh? So uh, this is uh, so this is the, some of the uh, the ideas of enlightenment. I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to translate this word. Yeah, this word samboda, which often is translated as awakening yeah, or enlightenment. Uh, these two words, awakening, enlightenment. Which one is the best one? Uh, yeah, can we understand the idea of uh, uh, samboda better by discussing these words uh, and trying to understand what they are about? Uh, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to have a little sip of this uh, 
It's very interesting. Yeah. There's a reddish color to it. Is that because of the... So the cup, is it? The cup. Ah, that was disappointing. Okay. Yes, it was just plain water. Okay. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about these two words, uh, and, uh, enlightenment and awakening, and which one might be a better translation of the word samboda. Yeah, we hear both of these words being used. Uh, I have tended to prefer awakening because to me I felt it was more meaningful. I thought enlightenment had been overused, but maybe, I, I, I'm not so sure, maybe I'm wrong about that. And I think sometimes it is a matter of personal choice. Uh, but still, they are interesting words. Uh, and the word enlightenment, uh, you know, uh, obviously has to do with the idea of light. So enlightened means the light going on, right? That's really kind of what it means. Uh, of course, in the Western culture, it has a reference back to the end of the Middle Ages, uh, when the Age of Enlightenment came, uh, and people started to use the scientific method and started to look at the world through non-religious, or non-Christian, I should say, because the only religion in those days was Christianity, there wasn't much choice. And uh, so people started to, so that was kind of the Age of Enlightenment. Uh, and that sort of fits a little bit about with the idea of Buddhism, yeah? about approaching truth, about seeing things according to reality, understanding things in the right way. Yeah? And the idea of the light going on is used in the suttas uh, to explain the idea of samboda. Yeah? You find this in the suttas. Uh, and one of the things that you find in the suttas, uh, the Buddha says, is like you're turning on the light in the dark yeah? so that those with eyes can see. Yeah? Yeah. So the question is, have you got eyes? If you haven't got eyes, you have a problem. Yeah, you can't see, even if you turn on the light, you can't see anything. And of course, having eyes means that you are open to these teachings. If you aren't open to the teachings, you can turn on the light as much as you want. You're still going to have the, the you know, the uh, kind of those things that you, what do you call those things you have in airplanes? You're going to those, uh, anyway, those blinds or whatever you call them. Eye mask, okay, eye mask, okay, that sounds reasonable, doesn't it? That sounds like a good, good word for it, okay. Those kind of things that shut out the light. So, uh, take those all first, then the light is going to work, otherwise it's not going to work. Yeah. And so the idea there is that the Buddha turns on the light, uh, yeah. The Buddha is said to be the eye of the world. Uh, and when you turn on the light, uh, you can see where you should go. You can see that if you walk in the wrong place, you will stumble, you will fall over. Yeah? You will trip on you know, going through the door or whatever. Yeah? Yeah? And you have all of these pains because you have no idea what's going on. You will hit your head against the rafters uh, and whatever else it is. Uh. So turning on the light is very useful because now suddenly you can see. Yeah? You understand what you have to do, where you have to go. Uh. When the light is off, you're going to have suffering. You're going to have lots of pain because you have no idea what's going on. Uh. So that is a nice way of thinking about it. And when you think about the mind that we are trying to develop on this path, we're trying to develop a bright mind. It is as if we are turning up the power in the mind, brightening up the mind, enlightening the mind, stage by stage, uh, turning up the wattage, like a dial going up, 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 yeah, brighter and brighter and brighter. Uh, that's another beautiful way of thinking about the idea of the spiritual path, uh, brightening up the mind. Uh, we often talk about things like samadhi nimittas, yeah, the light in the mind that you get when you practice still peaceful meditation. And that is one way of thinking about light. But there's also a more general idea of brightness of the mind. Yeah, the mind that is clear and bright, where there isn't any kind of clouds or defilements and, and, uh, and uh, uh, tiredness and lethargy and this kind of, I was going to say sloth and torpor, but that sounds like it's coming out of the... Some, ancient book, but, but lethargy and tiredness might be better words to use. Uh, yeah, the light goes on. Uh, these dark aspects of the mind, they kind of fade away. Yeah. So the idea of enlightenment has some beautiful ideas to it. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is how it is often used uh, in the sutta, as a brightness that you're building up. Uh, the mind is sometimes called the pabasara chitta. Pabasara means like the... Um, not the mind, as I said, the, the developed mind is called that. Uh, Pabasara means like the shining, or the brilliant mind. Uh, it is the mind of samadhi. Uh, yeah, Pabasara. Uh, it is this, uh, I know, it's kind of a nice word, Pabasara. I like that word for some reason. Uh, maybe it's just me. Uh, and so this is uh, the standard uh, word or standard uh, phrasing, the idea of turning on the lights of those with 
eyes can see forms in the dark. It's the standard phrasing when someone becomes enlightened, or actually not the full enlightenment, but when they become a stream mentor, the first stage of awakening. That's when the light goes on for the first time. And there's a few more uh, similes in there. The light going on is one of them. The few more similes that are actually really nice, and maybe talk about those briefly. Uh, he also says that when you become a stream mentor, yeah, in other words, you have your first kind of full insight into the Dhamma, first stage of awakening. You can call that awakening if you like, even though it's not the full, the real deal, uh, or full deal yet. Uh, his, the Buddha says it's like, uh, uh, it's like um, uh, uh, turning upright what was overturned. Yeah, something was upside down, you turn it upright. And that's kind of, that's interesting. Yeah? It means that uh, if you're not enlightened, uh, if you don't have insight into the Dhamma, uh, you're seeing things upside down. That is not how we normally think about life, that we're seeing things upside down, right? But actually we have a very powerful distortion in our mental faculties. And this idea of mental distortion is something that you find in the suttas. They're called vipalasa. Vipalasa means a distortion. And these distortions are found on all levels of the mind. Perception, thought, views. Yeah, the whole men our entire mental construct is distorted in this way. And the distortions are fourfold. And one of those distortions is the one where we see permanence, where things are impermanent. Yeah, we have a tendency to th see things as much more reliable, much more solid than they actually are. Yeah, this is seeing permanence where things are impermanent. One of the places we obviously see that is in relation to ourselves. We feel more solid than we actually are. This is why insight into your mind is like a revolution in consciousness when you have full insight. Yeah, things are really turned upside down. So, yeah, upside down. Suddenly you understand the danger of impermanence, how utterly pervasive it is, how things can change so fast, because the underlying conditions that make change happen are always building up, out of sight. We don't really see what's going on. And suddenly you have a war in Ukraine. Suddenly you die. The Buddha said you should be ready to die on your next breath, because suddenly it happens. And if you're not that ready not now, you're never going to be ready. Suddenly there's climate change. Suddenly there's an asteroid hitting the Earth and everyone, all of humanity is wiped out. Suddenly there's a nuclear war. Suddenly there's a tsunami. Actually, I'm being very negative now. Suddenly there's something positive happening. So not the Buddha arises in the world, right? The good things happen as well, not just the bad things. I'm being a, being a bit negative. But the, the bad things are more useful to reflect on because they, they are the things we often forget. We take the good things for granted, but the bad things we forget about. So things are really out of control, and we don't really see that. And that's why people that look at the news or they read the news on the internet or the TV or whatever, that's why they become upset at the news. That's why they grieve when the oceans are kind of, you know, rising. That's why they find it so horrible to watch the war in Ukraine. Why? Because they didn't understand impermanence. That is the main reason. Every time the world upsets you, every time something in your body upsets you, every time you get sick, you think, oh no, I'm sick. That's wrong with you right there. Oh no, oh yes, I got sick. That's what you should think. Is that what you think? Oh yes, I got sick. <laughs> Because that is kind of the reality of things. Oh yes, I'm getting old. Oh yes, I'm dying. Of course I'm dying. Kind of, uh, it's obvious. It's, but it's hard to take these things fully on board. So our views are upside down. But this is the first one, seeing impermanence as, uh, seeing what is impermanent as permanent. And then there's the idea of seeing uh, happiness uh, where actually there is suffering. Yeah. And we have, because of our sense of self, uh, we have a vested interest in so many things in the world. And that vested interest blinds us to the reality of what's actually going on. Yeah, and it, the blindness is very, very powerful. And we see happiness, we try to, to kind of um, gain happiness out of things that actually can never deliver. Yeah, and this is a very, part, very, very big part of this delusion. And then there's seeing a self where there is no self. Seeing, again, this is very similar to the idea of permanence. Seeing beauty where actually things are not really beautiful. Yeah, so we see things upside down. So the Buddha turns things the right way up. And when he turns things the right way up, it allows us to live in a new way. 
Yeah? This, these things are not really despairing. Yeah? This is just a reality. Once you have the reality clarified for you, it allows you to change course, uh, to do something different with your life. That is the whole point of this. Uh, it is not, you know, we don't say these things to make people depressed. Uh, are you, anyone, hope, hope, no, no, hope nobody is getting depressed. Uh, yeah? You all look like such really uh, kind of, uh, kind of super duper Buddhist, so I guess you are kind of used to this kind of... I said I was going to talk more about happiness at the beginning, but this is why people get turned off, right? Because it never, it always ends up with dukkha and suffering, these kind of things. So it seems to be impossible to kind of, it's kind of automatic, right? It's like you get kind of sidetracked, you get kind of railroaded onto this negative track. Yeah? But the point is there is a solution, huh? and that is, of course, the whole point. Huh? Welcome, please come in there. So the solution is there, and that is why, when we turn it upside down, huh? the solution comes into view. Huh? And of course, the solution is the spiritual path. Huh? That is exactly what it is. Huh? So this is the idea of turning upright huh? what was overturned. Huh? Yeah? And then the Buddha has another simile used. Again, this is for the awakening experience when you become a stream enter. He says it is like the, you reveal what is hidden. Yeah, it's like, and there's another of these beautiful ideas in the suttas that the, the world is veiled. There's a veil, it's like a curtain in front of the world. Yeah, it is not entirely, it's not a, not a thick curtain like this, more like a veil, like a bride's veil. You can see a little bit through her, but it's blurred and uncertain. And the Buddha draws back the veil from the world. It's one of the things you find, kind of beautiful images you find in the suttas. And so we have an idea of what is there, but it's all blurry, it is all uncertain. It's a bit dreamy. Are we living a dream? Maybe we're living a dream. One of the... Um, I'll come back to that later on, the idea of a dream. Uh, but, um, yeah, it is veiled. We don't see things clearly here. Yeah. And then, gradually, as we start practicing the Dhamma, practicing these teachings, uh, because we are unloading some of those distortions of the mind, gradually reducing them, it's like the veil is becoming more and more transparent. Uh, it's like this magical veil that can become more and more transparent. You see more and more through it uh, until one day the veil is completely withdrawn from the world. Uh, and for some people, those veils are like thick curtains, I think. Yeah. So some people have curtains, some people have veils, uh, and the very rare people have no veil whatsoever. Uh. So that is the idea of the veil, of turning upright what was overturned, uh, turning on the light like this. That's right, the last one is showing the way to someone who is lost. This is another beautiful idea from the suttas. Uh, because uh, the majority of people in the world are lost. And if you're not a stream mentor, in fact, you're still a little bit lost. What does it mean to be lost? It means like one of the um, images in the suttas is the image of the idea of roaming around in samsara. Yeah? I love the English word roam because roam has this feeling of no destination, no purpose, no aim, not going anywhere. It's random movement. Uh, if someone is roaming around the streets of London, uh, they usually get picked up by the police, right? Uh, because people think, okay, this fellow is, oh, is not going anywhere. This, this looks like very dodgy. Okay, so pick them up and we better ask them some few questions. You know, this roaming around is no good. Yeah, so roaming is considered bad and in Buddhism too because it means you have no destination. Uh, and so we are roaming around, going left and right and forward and backwards uh, without purpose. Uh. And this is kind of what samsaric existence is about. Yeah? This, uh, this, this, this problem that we're not actually going anywhere. And then one day the Buddha comes uh, and he shows you the path. This is the way. And when you follow that path, uh, where do you go? There's another beautiful simile in the sutta, the simile of the ancient city. Uh. You know that simile from the suttas? Eh? This is found in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the connected discourse of the Buddha, the discourses on dependent origination, number 65. The, the, the sutta is called the Nagara Sutta in Pali. Eh? And it is this, the Buddha talks about his time before his awakening. Eh? And he says, uh, uh, it is like I was walking through the forest. Eh? And one day, as I was walking through the forest, eh, I found this ancient path. Eh? And this ancient path was the path of the old Buddhas, right? Buddhas from the past. And as I followed this path through the jungle, I came to this ancient city. 
And when I came to this ancient city, this ancient city is Nibbana. Huh? When I got there, huh? I told the people of the world. Huh? And when the people of the world were told, huh? they went to that city, they came to the same city, huh? and they made it prosperous and beautiful and cleared it out to make it beautiful again. Huh? When the Buddha told the world about the Dhamma, other people became enlightened. Uh, the city of Nibbana, the city of awakening, monks and nuns, lay people, female and male, everyone uh, started to arise and achieve these kind of insights attaining Nibbana. Uh, it's really evocative. Yeah? They're, they're walking through the jungle. The jungle is a jungle of life. The jungle of the five senses, the jungle of the sense of self, which always deludes us, leads us astray, going in the wrong way. Yeah? And one day you clear it away here. Yeah? One day you understand what is going on there, and then you start moving towards the city here. But it's like an adventure in a sense, right? Finding an ancient city in a jungle is like an adventure. Here. And in one way, the spiritual path is also like this really exciting adventure. Here. The Buddha tells us about the spiritual path. It has all of these happinesses, all of these joys, all of these levels of peace. It's like extraordinarily exciting. And at the same time, you get insight into the nature of reality here. What else do you want in your life? Right? It's like everything is there. So this is like an adventure journey at the same time. So the Buddha points out this ancient path that was walked by Buddhas in the past. And now he makes it available for us again. And we follow that path and we experience some of these things, eventually reaching Sambodhi or Samboda. So this is the idea of enlightenment. Yeah? These are the four kind of ways the Buddha talks about this. And it's very, very beautiful and meaningful. We're just having taking the time because time is always goes much faster than I think it does. I think, okay, I'll talk for five minutes now, half an hour, and that's kind of problematic. So, um, so that is... Uh, one of these uh, ideas, so that is kind of enlightenment, yeah? the light going on, etc., et which I think is very nice and very evocative in many ways of what uh, Samboda is about. But then there's the awakening side. Uh, yeah? And awakening, too, is kind of very an interesting word uh, because it's this idea of kind of waking up from a dream, in a sense. Uh, yeah? Are we really in this reality or are we dreaming about the world? Uh, what is actually going on in our ordinary life? Is there a state where we are less dreamy and more awake? And one of the interesting things, I was in Poland recently. So David, I was back in your home country. Yeah, it was, it was very nice to be in Poland, by the way. There's so much interest in Buddhism in Poland. It makes the UK look like a little brother in comparison, to be honest. <laughs> You know, Poland is just, I was, I'm really surprised. I think it must be the country in Europe with the most interest in Buddhist teachings. That's absolutely astonishing. Um, but uh, what was interesting about Polish is that the Polish language, uh, in some of the words in Polish, are quite closely connected with the Pali words. And one of them is the word Buddha, which is also found in Polish and in Russian and some of the other Slavic languages. Uh, and it means to wake up. In the morning, you Buddha, oh, you wake up. Uh, yeah? So <laughs> obviously it's related to the ancient Buddhist idea of awakening, yeah? still in the present day. Yeah? So in what sense are we waking up? And uh, one of the uh, great similes of the Buddha that I like to kind of talk about usually uh, is the idea of waking up from a dream. The Buddha actually talks about this in the suttas. Uh, and the dream, according to the suttas, is the dream of the world of the five senses. Uh, this is the main waking up, or the initial waking up. It's kind of waking up to this world. Uh, why is this world like a dream? And the reason why it is, I think it is like a dream is that our ideas of this world are very different from the reality. Yeah, the idea of this world is what life is going to be like. And I remember when I was at university and I remember kind of thinking about what my life was going to be like. I didn't have that much interest in Buddhism yet. There was a little bit, but not that much. So I was always thinking, yeah, I'm going to have this kind of career, and I'm going to kind of have this kind of girlfriend maybe, and I'm going to have this kind of house, and I'm going to, I'm going to do really well. You know, when you're young, you're pretty conceited about yourself, and I, I probably was no exception. Yeah, okay, I'm going to be kind of the master of the universe or something like that, <laughs> something like that, something silly. And of course, I ended up like this. That was a bit of a waste of time to think about all those things. But, and, and so, but of course, the reality is never like that. Yeah? You never actually get to those things that you think about in your mind. 
if you get you get somewhere, but it's not, not exactly where you thought you were going to get, and it's not as satisfying as you thought you were going to. There's still more to be done. You never really reach any real goal, and it carries on into something else, and things get distorted and move into a different direction. But the dream was just a dream. It was an illusion. It wasn't really real. The things you were thinking about, and the five sense world is always like that. Whenever you have a desire about something in the five sense world. You will know that the distance between the desire and the reality, there's always a fairly big gap. The desire is always lying to you. The desire is always a dream. It is not reality. This is the nature of that five sense world. So this idea of dreaming, yeah, and uh, the way the Buddha explains it in this particular sutta, this is uh, the Potalya Sutta, middle length sayings of the Buddha number 54. And he says it's like you have a dream about all this beautiful scenery, all the beautiful world, beautiful ponds, beautiful forests, beautiful whatever, and you wake up in the morning and it's all gone. It is not there. So this is how you kind of, this is how the Buddha understands that dream. How do you deal with the dreams of the life? How do you get out of them? And one of my favorite teachings from Ajahn Brahma, Ajahn Brahm is my great hero. He's been my teacher for 30 years. And uh, usually it is said that uh, familiarity breeds contempt. Yeah? So after 30 years, yeah, Ajahn Brahm, yeah, whatever, what does he know? No. But for me, it's more like after 30 years, I probably have more respect for him than ever. Yeah? And this is kind of, to me, a sign of a, a teacher who is very special. Yeah? And he has taught me so many incredibly useful things and very simple things. Yeah? And one of those really useful things that I learned from Ajahn Brahm in my very early days uh, was to always ask the question, and then what? Have you heard that question before? The and then what question, yeah? And the idea is that uh, you, when you desire something, you desire a house, you desire a relationship, you desire a new car, you desire whatever it is, uh, you, should, you should never, s the problem with those desires, uh, the desire, the fantasy, the dream stops at the fulfillment of the desire and doesn't go beyond that. Have you noticed that? In your life? Yeah? It goes. When you get that relationship, it stops there. Yeah? It stops at the, you know, whatever. Once you get to that relationship, it stops there. It doesn't go beyond us. Well, then what? What the day after you get married? What happens two years after you're married? Five years? Is it going to be rosy? Are you, is, are, is you, you know, in the worst case, maybe a person you married to is going to die, they might get cancer or something. Or you might get divorced. Or you might have lots of arguments. Do you know the person you get married to? Often we don't. We get married to someone and they change after they get married because everyone is subject to change. So the and then what idea, and this is how the way Ajahn Brahm explained it to me, he said, the and then what idea works like this. At the end of the Western movie, the cowboy rides into the sunset with the girl. Yeah, and that stops there. Then the kind of the text comes down. Yeah, Clint Eastwood, blah, 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 and this kind of thing, right? <laughs> and, but actually, you shouldn't. And when they ride off the, into the sunset, you should ask, and then what? Well, and then what they ride off, and they go to their house, and they have to you know, do the housework. Wash the dishes, vacuum the floors, right? Look after the crying children. Actually, it's not as good as you think it is, yeah? And then what? It bursts that bubble, the bubble of illusion, which is the dream of the world. The world is never like that. It's never, it's never like the way we think it is. And you need some kind of clear guidance like that to actually be able to burst the bubble and see the reality for what it is. Every one of us is going to die at some point. It always comes at a very inconvenient time, death. Never really convenient, yeah? Oh yeah, now it's really convenient, okay, I'll die. That doesn't really work like that, yeah? Usually it's inconvenient, it comes at the wrong time. You see people on the deathbed, they're 80, 90 years old, yeah? And you say, oh yeah, are you, how are you? Oh yeah, I still have a few days left. <laughs> There's always a bit more, right? No one is ever ready to die, even though they should be absolutely ready. We should really be ready at all times. And so this is the way how to get out of this. And uh, this is the idea of waking up from the dream. That is the first wake up. The second wake up is the waking up from the sense of self. That's the secondary wake up. First out of the sense pleasures, then the sense of self. And this always comes in that sequence.
You always have to get out of the attachment to the sensory world first, then you can overcome the attachment or the idea of the sense of self. Always in that sequence, that is when it works. So uh, this is some of the ideas behind awakening and enlightenment and why they can be, why they are useful words to use uh, and how they actually, uh, you know, how to think about this. So I, now that we have kind of established a little bit about what awakening is, uh, yeah, I want to ask how do we then apply this in practice? Uh, yeah, how do we apply this to decide who is enlightened and who is not? Uh, how to kind of uh, uh, evaluate if someone comes up to you on the street and says, I'm enlightened, uh, I'm the new next Buddha. Uh, yeah? what, what will you do if that happens to you? Uh? What would you do if you kind of walk down the street in London and someone says, yeah, hi, I'm the next Buddha. Uh, what you would do is probably run, run a mile, right? Because you'd, you'd be scared, like, this is probably someone who is kind of really nuts, yeah? Or they've kind of lost the plot completely, yeah? And um, so, so but, but that is also a kind of dangerous thing, yeah? I, you know, one of the stories that I kind of love from the suttas is the story of uh, this uh, fellow called Upaka. Uh, and this is very soon after the Buddha's awakening, yeah, that the Buddha is walking from the place of awakening to meet the first, the five ascetics, and give them a teaching. And on the way, he meets this Ajivaka ascetic, belonging to the Ajivaka sect. And this Ajivaka ascetic, he's one of the first people to kind of see the Buddha after his awakening. Yeah. So he sees the Buddha. He says, wow! Well, he doesn't say exactly wow, but you know, the equivalent of, ancient, the ancient Indian equivalent of wow. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, wa. Wa, is it? Uh, Hare wa. Hare wa. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word for it. So, uh, so he, uh, and he sees that there's something about this person called the Buddha. He's not called the Buddha yet, but you know, uh, this person, that, there's something about him that is extraordinary. Yeah, he's kind of shining. Yeah. He's extremely peaceful. Yeah. His faculties are very, very powerful and very, very clear. Yeah. And so when he sees the Buddha, he asks him, yeah, wow, what happened to you? <laughs> and not exactly that. He's, I think he asked, one of the questions he asked me is, well, who is your teacher? Yeah, first of all, he says, well, you know, who, who are you? And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, I've achieved awakening. And then he says, well, who is your teacher? And then the Buddha replies, uh, I have no teacher. And at that point, he becomes a bit like that crazy person walking down the street in London and saying, I'm, I'm the Buddha, right? Uh, because I have no teacher, I have awakened by myself, yeah? That's just too much. People can't know how to deal with that. And so this Ajivika said, yeah, okay, whatever, whatever, and he kind of shakes his head and he walks off. And he walks off on the Kumaga. The Kumaga is the wrong path. Yeah, it's kind of, a, kind of a very clear indication that he has lost the plot. And this is the problem in the world. If you met the Buddha, would you recognize the Buddha? Or would you walk off in the wrong direction? Yeah, and I think many of us, we would just walk off in the wrong direction. Yeah. I often hear people, the Buddhists saying, well, you know, yeah, the Buddhism today is kind of deteriorating and going downhill, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to hang out for the next Buddha. I'm going to wait for Maitreya to come around, then I'll kind of be a Buddhist. Yeah. But if you met Maitreya Buddha, you probably wouldn't recognize Maitreya Buddha. Yeah? You'd probably be like Upaka and you walk off in the wrong direction. Yeah. Now is the chance. Now is the opportunity. Now you have these teachings. Yeah. Now you need to recognize who is enlightened. So how do you do that? And um, one of the ways of recognizing awakening uh, is to understand that awakening uh, has an impact on what kind of person you are. Uh, yeah, if you see the truth of reality, uh, that actually has a very, po very powerful impact on your psychological makeup. Uh, and one of the things it does, according to the suttas, it eliminates all the defilements of the mind. And when all the defilements of the mind are eliminated, your conduct, who you are as a person, is completely transformed. You are a different kind of person from then on. Yeah. And so awakening manifests itself in kindness, in compassion, in clarity, in peace, in a sense of wisdom. Yeah. In a, in a kind of coolness, uh, of, you know, in the higher sense of coolness. Uh, yeah. So the qualities are there. You should feel that this person uh, 
has something to offer uh, that most people don't. Uh, there are qualities in this person that are, are really exceptional. Uh. If you hear uh, that someone is enlightened but does weird things, uh, and this is what you hear very often, yeah, oh, this person is enlightened but they kind of, they, uh, you know, they also abuse me a little bit from time to time. It's for my own good, so it's all right. Uh, yeah, so, uh, or I remember one monk who was quite a good friend many years ago. He said, yeah, this is really cool teacher in Thailand. Yeah, he's so cool. Sometimes he kind of punches people in the face. Uh, he's an arahant, by the way. Yeah. I said, what? He's an arahant? He's fully enlightened. He punches people in the face? Uh, you must be joking. Yeah. And he said, no, no, he's, he's, a real, he's a real deal. Uh, and I, think, I thought to myself, where are you? <laughs> ne please never think like that. If someone punches you in the face, they're not an arahant. An arahant is a gentle person. It's someone who is kind. Someone who wants to help you, right? And they don't use kind of this skillful, so-called skillful means to help you. It's just a skillful mean. You just needed a punch. That's not how it works. You don't simply don't punch people if you're an arahant. Nor do you have affairs with your disciples. Nor do you do all of these kind of things that are obviously dodgy. So trust your own judgment. This is kind of one of the really important things when it comes to awakening. Don't go with the crowd. Be the black sheep. You have some fairly dark clothes over there, so you're on the right track. The black sheep clothes, yeah? Put on, put on some dark clothes, yeah? And then you are kind of on the right track. Be the black sheep. Don't follow the crowd. Eh? Because the crowd get into these hallucinations that this is an awakened person, even though they do things that are obviously counter to how an enlightened person should actually behave. Eh? So never allow these things to kind of, to, never allow yourself to kind of uh, be blinded by stupidity and by silliness. If there is reasons for doubt, if you see problems in someone, you should always acknowledge that there is potential problem there. And when you acknowledge that there's a potential problem there, then you're doing the right thing. If a million people says, we will go this way, but if you see something dodgy going on, don't follow those million people. Be the black sheep. Ajahn Brahm is to me the kind of the the number one black sheep in the world, right? Uh, he goes against the directions of most people. He dares to ordain bhikkhunis, even though the rest of the world says, don't ordain bhikkhunis. He says, this is the right thing to do, so we should do it. Uh, actually, the number one black sheep in the world was uh, the Buddha. You reckon the Buddha was a black sheep? Uh, I reckon he was a black sheep because he dared to go against the stream. He dared to go against the prevailing values in the ancient Indian society. He dared to challenge the most sacred ideas of the Brahmanical religion at that time, to go against the ideas of the self and the Brahman and all of these things that were fundamental in that society. So black sheep to me is a badge of honor. So someone said we should call it black sheep, we should call it green sheep instead. But apparently there was an, some Icelandic artist who kind of painted all the sheep as green. And so that was kind of the, because they were different. So maybe green sheep is an alternative. I don't know. Anyway, that's, uh, that's, that's not sure about that one. So, but tr so trust your own judgment. That is my point. Don't be afraid. Sometimes people say, oh, my, I am so, you know, I, I don't know, you know, so how can I trust my own judgment? I would rather follow this teacher because they will show me the right judgment. But how do you decide to follow that teacher? That is your judgment, right? It always comes back to your judgment, regardless of what happens. So trust your own judgment. Don't be afraid of saying, this is going too far, this is wrong, this is not working out. Sometimes I have found, this is especially true in Buddhist countries and Buddhist cultures, people say it is bad karma if you criticize an arahant. Right? So someone has the reputation for an arahant, and because they have that reputation, uh, you think if you criticize them, you might be criticizing arahant, so you better kind of go along with everyone else and say, yeah, yeah, they're arahant, they're okay. Yeah. But actually the suttas say that if someone is worthy of criticism, it is good karma to acknowledge that. It's not good karma to criticize willy-nilly, but if someone really is worthy of criticism, it is the right thing to have be critical, yeah, and not to pretend that they're okay. Yeah? Because if we pretend that people are okay when they were worthy of criticism, we're leading everyone down the garden path uh, and we're making abuse possible in this world, uh, yeah, because abuse is often sometimes a problem. Not just abuse, but even lesser problems like wrong view, for example. Uh, 
If someone has wrong view, it is our duty to some, sometimes at least, not always, but sometimes to call it out. Because if we don't call it out, no one is going to do it. And then we're actually blinding people. We're closing off the possibility for the path. Actually, listen, the Buddha said this. This person is saying that. It doesn't fit with how the Buddha taught. There's a problem here. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. So but I'm not finished yet, you know. So I have to finish first. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll wrap it up fairly quickly. I'm coming to the end anyway, so it should be okay. Yeah. So the idea is that uh, you know when we uh, deal with awakening, yeah, we know that awakening, someone who is awakened, is supposed to be a pure person. Yeah. We're supposed to have all of these marvelous qualities, and when we don't see those qualities in that person, we have grounds for doubt. Don't be afraid of acknowledging the doubt. At the same time, be humble about it. Yeah, it's important also to understand the limitations, your own ability to understand other people, to see. Uh, you, you know, it's, sometimes it can be hard, sometimes it can really be tricky to understand. So acknowledge your own limitations, but at the same time, if there is reasons for doubt, don't suppress the doubt. So this ability to walk this middle way, not to have firm opinions about things, but acknowledging that there may be a problem. And when you acknowledge that there may be a problem, you withdraw a little bit. You don't place so much confidence in this person. And you withdraw from the problem, and you withdraw a little bit from the potential issues. So, um, be Smart. Uh, trust your judgment uh, uh, in this about these things. Don't be led by other people too much, uh, and then you're going to be on the right track. Uh. And then, as you then find a good teacher in this way, you find someone who has the integrity, uh, who you have watched for a long period of time. Uh, one of the things the Buddha says is that if you want to watch someone and understand their wisdom, uh, you have to watch them for a long time. Uh, you have to be attentive. Uh, you have to be wise yourself. That's kind of this is often the downside, yeah, because uh, you don't know how wise you are. But hopefully, you have enough wisdom, uh, and uh, then uh, you have discussions with them. And this is how you uncover and you start to understand whether someone is wise, uh, whether they have integrity, uh, whether they have fortitude, and these kind of things. Uh, this is specifically said in the suttas. Uh, so keep on watching. Uh, don't come to conclusions quickly. Uh, and when you see that integrity over time. You see the good qualities are there, they are consistent. Uh, then you start to know that this is somewhere you can place at least some degree of confidence. Uh, and of course the Buddha invites people to these things himself. Yeah? In the suttas he invites people to basically look at him and ask if there is a problem and ask if there is an issue with integrity. Uh, and so this is another beautiful thing in Buddhism, which I think is unique to the Buddhist teachings, uh, that actually the leader of the whole religion, ask, look at me here, do I have the integrity that is required? And then you choose a teacher in this way, yeah, starting with the Buddha, ideally, and then maybe having living teachers. It's good to have some living teachers as well, because they kind of bring the word of the Buddha alive in a certain sense. And then you start practicing this path. And then as you start practicing this path, there is a gradual awakening happening within you. Yeah, and the gradual awakening starts with very small things. Uh, it starts with the idea of morality, uh, because that already is a kind of awakening uh, when you understand that living a moral life uh, leads to happiness for yourself uh, and for others. Uh, that is a kind of understanding, yeah? it's an insight already, a small awakening there. Uh, then, uh, as you live morally to the best of your ability, uh, and when I say to the best of ability, I mean really the best of your ability, yeah? don't hold back on the morality, give it everything you've got. Uh, then you start to do the meditation practice. And through the meditation practice, you gradually give up the world of the five senses. And because that world of the five senses is the world of the dream, you're now really coming into clarity, now really starting to wake up. Yeah? Remember the simile of the dream before. Meditation, eventually, you let go of the five senses in the body, and you enter the world of samadhi, the world of bliss, the world of purity, the world of complete contentment. And you start to get the feeling for the meaning of life itself. Then, beyond that, you also break through 
uh, the delusion of a self as well there. And this is where the kind of final barrier, we really come through to the idea of awakening and enlightenment in your own life. Uh, when you give up the idea of a sense of self, uh, you lose all vested interest in the world. Uh, because you lose all vested interest in the world, including yourself, uh, it means that you have the ability to see the world clearly for the first time. Uh, as long as the sense of self is there, there is a vested interest in the world. Uh, only by giving that up can you see the world clearly. Then you can see impermanence, you can see dukkha, uh, yeah, the problem of suffering in the world, clearly for the very first time, uh, because the vested interest is gone. Uh, and that is when you understand real happiness uh, and suffering, uh, and you can actually make that distinction for the first time. Uh, you achieve the highest happiness as a consequence. Uh, and that then is the uh, kind of awakening experience uh, in the final analysis, uh, yeah, the idea of uh, giving up that sense of self, uh, losing the vested interest in the world, uh, and because of that, understanding happiness and suffering fully, which is where we started out uh, by defining right view uh, and defining uh, the idea of uh, seeing things clearly. Uh. Anyway, so uh, I have promised to wrap it up quickly, so that was my quick wrapping up. Uh. So. Uh, that's it. So there's a few little things about awakening and or enlightenment, depending on how you want to translate it. So now, if you wish to ask questions or uh, uh, make any comments, please feel free to do so. Yeah. so yeah. Okay, uh, Venerable Chanda will bring the microphone around. So uh, you can please speak into the microphone so we get the question recorded. I think that's the idea here. Yeah. Has anyone here met some dodgy gurus they want to talk? <laughs> I have a question in regards to what is what I heard most of the times that the Buddha, when Buddha replied to this uh, um, ascetic, the, uh, to the question whether he had any teachers and it feels like it's a bit unfair to say that he had no teachers, given that what he did in the end, he, he tried paths of some teachers, of different ones, and, and they, he realized that they were not leading in the right direction, yet what he then do was a bit of a creativity, which often is taking the known things and putting in an unknown way. So, so that's how... It feels that maybe it wasn't answered exactly, like I didn't have any teachers, but that, that's just my one fault, you know, that this... Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, that, that is true, but I think the point is that he didn't have a teacher to teach him awakening itself. I mean, of course, everyone has teachers. I mean, you could say when you were a child, you had a teacher to learn, you have to plow the fields, or how to be kind, and the simple things. So everyone has some teachers, but the point is that he didn't have a teacher to teach him the specific thing that he was looking for, which was awakening him. So, I really like what you mentioned, by the way, about the Buddha learned from many people before, and there was no exact, you know, there's not really a disagreement, but just different viewpoint of understanding how the teachings led someone to enlightenment. What's a good way, because I've been asking this question to many teachers, to many different places around the world, how do we monitor our progress? Is there, have you discovered a scientific way or something that's effective in understanding where you're going wrong, how, where you're, do, where you're going right, and which direction is leading you into the right direction, and how exactly are you supposed to monitor your progress so you mm. ultimately arrive on the right path? Mm. Okay, so the, uh, the answer to that question has so many questions is found in the suttas. Yeah, the Buddha has already spoken about this. And, and uh, what he says is that you, what you should do is that you should always ask yourself, are your good qualities increasing and your bad qualities going down? If they are, you're on the right track. If your bad qualities are going up, your good qualities are going down, you're on the wrong track. Yeah. So whatever you do in your life, uh, for example, you have a certain teacher, 
You should ask yourself, are you making progress in that sense under that teacher? If you're not, you should leave that teacher and find someone else. Uh, so that kind of is the root idea and the root problem that you want to uh, kind of use as a guidance. So whenever you make a decision in life, uh, you make decisions on that basis. Uh, uh, this is what I have done in my life. I sometimes ask myself, staying at Bodhinana Monastery of Ajahn Brahm, should I stay in this monastery or not? Should I go somewhere else or not? Should I wear this kind of robe or that kind of robe? Should I eat this kind of food? Everything can be kind of decided using that kind of framework. Yeah? Yeah? And uh, so that is, uh, th that is really the, uh, the answer. Of course, it means also you cannot make decisions over short periods of time. You have to look at things in kind of at least a few months, right? Because, I mean, obviously the mind is a bit up and down. Sometimes you may have a difficult time because something happened in your life that was very difficult, so you get a bit depressed and you go down. So don't measure it then, right? Measure it when you kind of come out of that depression, and then kind of then you can kind of have a proper way of assessing whether you're making progress or not. But that is the basic idea. And if you are going well, living well, and I have found this in my life, you do actually gradually brighten up. Something happens inside of you. You become more kind. You become more compassionate. You become more caring. It's kind of obvious after a while. And uh, you know, I'd like to say that if you had met me before I was a monk, you probably would be horrified. Yeah, <laughs> because the change actually is quite dramatic. Yeah, if I. Uh, that's what, how it certainly feels to me from a kind of first person perspective and people say that as well yeah wow you have changed what happened to you now? and uh, this is very powerful i mean it, for me very powerful because this is also what happened with my family yeah, initially my family were completely aghast to become a buddhist monk Why you, what happened our upbringing has failed that's what i was told our upbringing has failed and then i I started to change, yeah, because instead of trying to kind of convert my parents to Buddhism, I thought, okay, let me live the Buddhist life. And then they really came around, and that was kind of like a miracle. And part of that was seeing the change in you as a person. So that is really all, I think that is sufficient piece of advice. If you find that you are not changing, yeah, you have to often ask yourself also some very direct questions. You have to be brutally honest with yourself, right? Where am I where am I failing? And sometimes we don't want to see where we are failing because we are attached to certain things. This is my personality. I don't want to do this. Yeah, this is who I am. So brutal honesty is important. Sometimes it's painful to acknowledge our own weaknesses. And uh, you know, but sometimes you are kind of faced with them. Some sometimes people say things to you that actually can be very interesting. Yeah? <coughs> A lot of the time when people complain about us or they say bad things about us, actually it's not really worth listening to because they're just venting their own anger or ill will, so you forget about it. But sometimes you get feedback from somebody, maybe from someone you don't expect, and it turns out to be really, really good. And then you go to the Dhammapada and the Buddha says, well, if someone criticizes you in the good way, it's like uncovering a treasure for you. Because it is the treasure of progress in the Dhamma that actually becomes available to you. And this is the most important thing in life, to make progress in the Dhamma. So the treasure is right there. So investigate very carefully where, you, where your blockages are. And then check out uh, you know, how your, your qualities, your mental qualities are, whether they're going up or not. Uh, this is the Buddha's advice in the suttas. Uh. You yeah, okay with that? Or, uh, yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Um, so do you think that enlightenment or awakening is well, well defined in a sense? I mean, with respect to sort of the Buddhist teachings, could, you, could one say this person is awakened and this person is not? Yeah, I, I probably didn't talk enough about that, the exact nature of awakening here. Um, so it is very well defined. And so the way how it is defined is usually defined as the ending of greed, hatred, and delusion. Right? Uh, or or loba dosa moha, desire, ill will, and confusion is another way of thinking about it. Uh, so if you have any kind of desires, you know that you're not awakened. If you have any kind of ill will, you're not awakened. Uh, and uh, by any kind, I mean any kind, like the tiniest bit of irritation or whatever. Uh, so that is a good indication already. Uh, delusion is a bit more tricky, but de delusion really comes down to things like the idea of a sense of self. You know, if you have a sense of self, you're not enlightened, uh, whatever kind of sense of self that is. Uh, so that, this is one way of thinking about it, and it's already quite a useful way. Uh, the, but uh, the, 
the one thing that the enlightened person knows for sure, if you are enlightened, uh, yeah, the one thing that is kind of said again and again in the suttas uh, is that you know that there is no rebirth in the future. Uh, you know that you will not be reborn. Uh, yeah? And that is a very specific kind of knowledge. Uh, and you may wonder, how can anyone possibly know that? Uh, yeah? Because it may seem weird. How can you possibly know that? Uh, and the reason is because you have understood uh, the causality between craving and rebirth. Uh, there's a very clear causality there, and you have seen that through insight, uh, that craving must lead to rebirth. Uh, and because you have eliminated craving, you have eliminated the cause of rebirth. Uh. And so it is actually an insight into the nature of craving that you have. Uh. Yeah? And uh, I'm not, not going to go into that in any more detail. I could, but maybe it's not necessary for now. But that is what it is. So you actually know that rebirth is ended. Uh. Yeah, and that is a very kind of clear sort of uh, uh, end point. So that is, um, that is that you have no, no, no more mental suffering. That's another kind of indication of awakening. Yeah, mental suffering is completely gone. Um, yeah, these are some of the most important ways that you know that. So that is the Buddhist idea of awakening. And then you have other ideas of awakening around the world. You have the ideas that you find in Advaita Vedanta, for example, some of the Hindu traditions. Uh, yeah? And uh, that is often, in Buddhism, we would call those kind of awakenings that they talk about, uh, I would call those samadhi experiences, profound, profound stillnesses of mind. Uh, and uh, they are so profound that it is not strange that people would call it awakening. It is a kind of small awakening, perhaps, right? Uh, but it's not the final awakening from the Buddhist point of view. Uh, so Buddhism would say that this is uh, it's good, you're on the right track, but you actually need to go a little bit further. Yeah. This is what the Buddhists would say in those circumstances. This is just from going from the descriptions of these states. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Are you, am I, did I answer your question? Or? Yes, I was going to ask a follow-up, but the mic is gone. Yeah, the mic is gone, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, thanks. I was just wondering what part do emotions play in this? Because um, I've been through quite a lot in the past year and I'm finding my emotions are getting in the way of my practice. And I'm wondering what comes first, my emotions or my mind, my thoughts? My emotions are quite intense and it's almost as if I can't face myself when I try to meditate because emotions of trauma arrive, and then I sink. Um, so, yeah. is it re-educating my mind, or how? What part do emotions play in enlightenment? Yeah. All right. Like, okay. Awakening. Sure. So they play a very important part, right? They are really, really important. Uh, very, very important. So you you want to before you can really make meditation work properly, you have to kind of get your emotions uh, uh, kind of. Um, in a certain direction, otherwise meditation is going to be very, very difficult. And so you have to, and the way to kind of, in a sense, um, uh, guide your emotions in the right way, it obviously starts with the Noble Eightfold Path, so you start by living, living to the best of your ability and doing all the right things, and as you do that, these emotions will kind of work themselves out over time, yeah, usually. So, so this is kind of part and parcel of that. The second aspect of this is the idea of right effort. Yeah? The idea of right effort is actually learning how to see things in a new way, yeah? changing your outlook with regard to things. Uh, if you have been through some very traumatic experiences, probably forgiveness might very well be one of the things that you may have to kind of do in that kind of situation. Uh, forgiveness is not something that happens straight away. It is a gradual, it's a process, like so many things on the path. Uh, so you try to use uh, that process of forgiving here. Uh, uh, to let go of some of those traumas in your life. Uh, it may also be useful, I don't know what you're doing, I, I would always recommend people to maybe see a good psychologist or something like that to help you getting some good advice uh, how to deal with trauma. Sometimes uh, Buddhists only give Buddhist solutions to traumas, but I think it's good to recognize that uh, we are not trauma specialists in Buddhism. Uh, we might be meditation specialists, but not necessarily trauma specialists. Uh, so understanding your own limitations is also useful. Uh, so uh, but learning to think about things in the right way, learning to have compassion even for uh, the perpetrators of crimes, yeah? gradually, gradually kind of coming out of it is very important. Uh, 
And this is one of those things that you, you know, see with like the war in Ukraine. How do you think about the invasion of Ukraine? That's basically what it is. So how do you reflect on that? And uh, what, how do you think about those Russians, uh, right? Uh, and the, of course, the answer from a Buddhist point of view is not really to blame them or to get angry or anything like that, uh, but to understand that they too are trapped in so many ways. They do this because of they basically don't have much choice. Uh, obvious thing is the soldiers, you know, the young soldiers going in, they're just you know, told by the army to shoot and kill or whatever. Uh, and often young people who don't really have enough much wisdom and they kind of are just trapped in a certain way because they want to make a living or something. Yeah. And how can you not have compassion for people like that? Yeah. And then you have people higher up in the army who are also trapped in a kind of system. Yeah. And at the very top of the thing, maybe you have something like Putin, maybe. Yeah. But even Putin, does he really know what he's doing? Yeah. Probably not. Yeah, he probably has no idea. If he really knew what he was doing, he would never do such a thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he's probably creating enormous amount of suffering for himself for the future by doing this. Uh, he's also in darkness. Uh, so he's causing enormous suffering for himself and also for so many other people. Uh, it's kind of tragic in a way, you know, when these things happen. Uh, so I think the right response in all of these situations is actually compassion all around. Uh, there's no point in having anger towards anyone, in the, even in this kind of situation. Uh, and once you start to see the world in that way, uh, and then you can broaden it out, and even to people who have treated you badly in life, uh, who have done things that have been really unfair, uh, and I think we have all been in those situations to some extent, uh, yeah, you can start to forgive, start to let go, uh, realize actually they don't really understand what's going on. They are deluded, uh, they are in darkness, uh, they're trying to create happiness for themselves, actually creating suffering, uh, and then you start to have compassion for them. Uh, something like that, but remember, remember it's gradual, yeah, it takes time. Uh, so uh, look after yourself, uh, and then uh, hopefully you'll be able to uh, to get there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anything else? I think we have a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going going blind. I can barely see. Yeah. I was having some of that. Well, uh, two things in my question. So I thought whether we like it or not, we are in the, in the storm of life. Mm. I thought. So from the very young age of us, we have these goals, so called goals in life, that we have, we have to, we are compelled to work towards mm. to achieve uh, success in life. Uh, from my young age, so we have to get ourselves educated, pass the exams, get a good job, so when the right time comes, get married to a good partner, have kids, so flourish in life. So uh, the first question is okay, uh, I was just on the, so is, are there any specific teachings that will guide us uh, to achieve these goals, or is it only uh, about uh, achieving uh, the harder that we are getting to. Okay. Okay, good. So, uh, what are the teachings to achieve these goals? And uh, the, uh, I, I think um, the answer is the Buddha doesn't really focus so much on those kind of goals. Uh, yeah? And uh, the reason is, uh, and I think this is the important point, uh, is that those goals, you don't know whether they can be achieved. Uh, you can put in, sometimes the problem of life is that you put in incredibly hard work at university yeah, and it doesn't work out. Yeah, you, maybe you, you still fail your exam because you're not intelligent enough or you had a bad day or you got sick at the wrong time or, or whatever. You, COVID came and destroyed your ability to, to do whatever. Yeah. So you work really hard and then you fail. You, go, you have a job, you may be a really, really good worker, but maybe your boss doesn't like you for whatever reason, some kind of come up from the past is blocking you. Huh? So the boss kind of ignores you, even though you're a really good worker. Huh? So the problem with the world is that you can put in enormous amounts of effort, but there's no guarantee that you will succeed. Huh? And this is the heartbreak of life sometimes, yeah? You find a partner, maybe you find a really good partner, huh? and she dies. These things happen all the time, right? Huh? You have kids, the kids may turn out to be, maybe you, you want to be proud of your kids. Most parents want to be proud of their kids. Uh, but maybe your kids are not going to make you proud. Uh, 
maybe they're going to feel, make you depressed. Because maybe they don't work at school, maybe they end up becoming criminals. Your kids can end up becoming criminals. How would you feel about that? Would you be okay with that? You should be okay with that. You should love your kids regardless. Yeah? The point about kids is that they come into this world with a certain personality that is already formed. There is no guarantee you will be able to direct them in the, in the right way because they have a massive baggage from the past. Your ability to guide is very, very small. If they become criminals, have compassion because they don't really know what they're doing. They are driven by some kind of demons from the past, by certain habits that are really, really bad. Yeah, have compassion for them. Don't be angry with them. If you're angry, they're going to make it worse. Okay, you, you, you become a criminal. It's okay, son. It's okay, daughter. What can I do to help you? I love you regardless. This is the right attitude. And so this is the problem, is that because the world is so unreliable, because there's no way to guarantee that you will succeed in any of these things, the Buddha says, rather than focusing on what we achieve in the world, focus on how you achieve things in the world. Because if you achieve things in the right way, through kindness, through compassion, through caring, through generosity, through all of these things, then you are doing two things. Yeah, you're, on the one hand, you're working in the world, and if you have success in the world, wonderful. But if you fail in the world, you have still have inner success in your heart. You will feel good about yourself. And when you come to the end of your life, you will know that you have lived a good life, and you will go to a good destination as a consequence. You will feel fulfilled as a human being. But if you work really hard in the world, yeah, and, but you do bad things on the way, you come to your deathbed, all of those things that you did in the world, you're going to have to give up. All that you take with you into the future are the bad deeds. You're going to feel like as a failure as a human being, even if you had success in ordinary life. So it's crazy to do that. So that's why don't focus too much on the worldly aims. Or focus on them, but focus on them in the right way. Don't allow those worldly aims to get in the way of morality and kindness. If those worldly aims make you do bad things, then you're on the right track. They have become too important for you. You should never allow them to do that. And then you are in the right way. If you want success in the world anyway, in my experience, the best way is to live morally, is to live with kindness. I have found in my life, I know some people who have been very successful, and some of them are really, really good people. They are successful precisely because they are good people. People trust them. People work hard for them because they have such good qualities. So sometimes we think that successful people are always bad, but actually, in my experience, that's wrong. Sometimes maybe, but they're not really successful down the track anyway. It's a temporary kind of success, and we're blinded by that. So live really well. Live according to Buddhist principles. That is the best way to do anything in life. So we only have five minutes left. So one more question, Rajan? Or? Yeah, let's see what kind of question it is first of all. Maybe a short one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's just a very short question. I just often wonder how to practice on mindfulness, you know, it's all the time, all the day. Because, you know, part of the Eightfold Path is to practice mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's part of the Noble Eightfold Path. So I often wondered how to actually skillfully do that during the daytime. Okay. It's very easy to do it during meditation. Yeah. Actually, how to do that. All right. So, so this, has, this, this, this question is a really good one, but it take, the answer is about half an hour long, yeah, 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 <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but the, the, the short answer is that um, there is too much emphasis on the idea of being mindful during the daily activity as in Buddhism. This is number one problem. Buddha doesn't really say you should just be mindful. Of course we should be mindful, but the Buddha doesn't say that mindfulness on its own is just a positive thing regardless. And this, I think, is a very important point that is often lost. Mindfulness must have a purpose. Yeah? So we should have enough mindfulness in daily life to enable us to live well, to live with kindness, to live with morality, to monitor our minds, we don't get too much anger and ill will. That is the right kind of mindfulness for daily life. But not the kind of mindfulness where you are just mindful moment to moment, anger arising, anger arising. Yeah. If anger is arising, you should do something with it, not just be aware of it. So mindfulness should have a very clear purpose. Then you are doing it right. 
instead of just having this general idea of mindfulness. And then what you will find, if you use mindfulness in that way, then the fact that you are living well will give rise to more mindfulness in the future. Yeah, that is where the mindfulness comes from. The cause of mindfulness is not mindfulness. The cause of mindfulness is kindness. I, sorry, I, have, I forgot that we're supposed to talk a little bit about Anukampa, is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, so I'll pass the microphone to you first of all. You can start off and I'll say a few words afterwards. Not warmed up yet? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. I, I should just, I would like to say a few words towards the very end. I, 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 I apologize for forgetting about this. But uh, uh, the reason that I'm here is because I was invited by Venerable Chanda. Yeah, so this is kind of why I'm here. And, uh, and the reason why I accepted her invitation is because I think she's doing a very marvelous and wonderful project, uh, which is the establishing of a monastery for Bikinis, fully ordained Buddhist nuns. Uh, this project is called the Anukampra Project, uh, and she's now residing in a small vihara, which vihara is like a monastery, in Oxford, uh, yeah, pretty much by herself, but she also now has, has her good friend, Venerable Pekka, who's visiting from Perth. Uh, and it's a wonderful project, uh, and I think it, it would be very valuable for the Buddhist community in the UK, uh, yeah, in the south of England at least, uh, to have a full-fledged Bikuni monastery that allows women to take full ordination if they so desire in the Buddhist teachings. There are already lots of opportunities for men. The opportunities for women are far, far inferior to that for men. So, and I think that is really, really important to have that sense of equality uh, as much as we can in Buddhist circles. Uh, this has been something that has been lacking for a long time in Buddhism. Uh, and now, when Chanda has taken the leadership in establishing this, it's a very difficult thing to do, to be a pioneer. Uh, really, really hard work, very difficult because you get a lot of opposition, you know, all of these kind of things. Uh, so it is an extraordinary service, I would say, that uh, Chanda is doing to Buddhism. Uh, through this work with Anakampra project. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to support her in whatever way, uh, I would really encourage you to do that, uh, because uh, I think uh, it is really worthy of support and really worthy of enormous respect, uh, the kind of work that she is undertaking here. So that is my, uh, <laughs> what I would say. Would you like to add something about it, Walter? Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Arjun, and it means a lot to this from you. It's, uh, just as in all projects and all endeavours in life, we have to have uh, inspirations, and you're one of my inspirations as a teacher, and also, of course, Ajahn Brahm is my uh, main comrade in this. So, uh, he and Ajahn Brahmali actually really supported and went out on a limb, really went out as cheerleaders for uh, the full ordination of women uh, in a radical way, just as the Buddha did many, many years ago. And um, yeah, there's a strong nuns community now in Australia. Um, small nuns communities for fully ordained nuns in America, but very little in Europe and nothing yet over here for now. So it's a big step. And uh, this step has really come about through organizing talks like this over the last seven years. So we've had Ajahn Brown coming every year. I'm sure many of you have been to his talks and retreats. And, uh, it's the second time Ajahn Bhamali is coming over to lead a, a seven-day retreat, starting tomorrow, and giving many other talks. So our purpose, really, as a charity, we're a UK charity, uh, religious and educational. So the educational aspect is precisely spreading the Buddha's teachings, and especially early Buddhism, which is closely connected to the Buddha's words, you know, so that we take him as our teacher. And, uh, and there's a measure, right, against which you can assess. Um, any progress that you make or that other so-called teachers claim to make, you can always go to the words of the Buddha for that and check whether it aligns. And then the other strand of the project is to actually give women the opportunity to lead their own communities, to ordain if they wish, and also for anyone here, whether you are like male, female, transgender, non-binary, I don't care, you can come. I mean, I care, right? I care that we have inclusivity. I care that everybody would feel welcome to come. So, uh, and it's lovely, you know, it's a small place, but I think in any monastery, including here, right, this is also a monastery in the heart of London, you have the chance to practice precisely what Richard was asking about, the eightfold path in daily life, yeah, in a relational sense, but also practice in solitude in the afternoons. So we try and have this balance. 
and uh, and hopefully it's something that can strengthen uh, Buddhism. And that might sound like a big thing to say. It's certainly not me that's strengthening Buddhism, but we need what the Buddha called the four pillars or the four assemblies, which are monastic men, monastic women, and laymen and laywomen, right? And to give those opportunities for everybody. And that way, we have more representation of Buddhism and Dhamma and the way it's meant to lead, right? So if you only see one person, then you don't necessarily identify with them. Your life experience is so different from theirs, or you know, you think, okay, they can do it because of their background, but I come from a different background, a different race, a different gender. Then it's a little bit disheartening. So my aim really is to have that um, bring diversity and bring opportunities to people who haven't had them yet. So um, yeah, I just really want to thank Ashwin and Mali for, for doing this because uh, although you love teaching the Dhamma, it's a long way to come. And uh, <laughs> the same for Ajahn Ram, you know, he's been supporting this for seven and eight years now. And uh, hopefully it will provide uh, opportunities for everybody here to practice the path and to reach this mythical awakening, which now is much clearer. <laughs> <laughs> so if you would like to support us, I should finish actually by saying if you'd like to support us, we do have uh, leaflets outside, also some at the back here, but we'll probably move it outside. Um, I think any donations you wish to make will go to, to the charity to support uh, offering these teachings and to support the resident monastic sangha's needs. So our shelter, food, requisites, medicine. And there's also opportunities to get involved to volunteer and to come to our online staff. So it doesn't end here. We have Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Ramali, and myself, and Rebecca, and other bikinis teaching um, pretty regularly, actually, two or three times a week on our YouTube channel and our Zoom thing as well. So you can join in live um, with the Zoom and we can discuss some more of the Buddha's teachings. So, uh, yeah, really warm welcome to everyone to be involved. And, uh, you have a wonderful evening and uh, the, the, the transport in London is reliable and not unreliable but that is very unreliable <laughs> very uncertain so good luck anyway and, uh, thank you very much for great coming. sadhu 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 <laughs> should we pay respect to the Buddha Dharma Sangha before we go yeah let's uh, let's do that together we'll just do the Arang Samasam Buddha together Arahang Sama Sambuddha Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Ape Vademe Svakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasame Sepate Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Sangang Namasame